some good advice about how you would manage a SOC 2? I would say as a step one, as good advice, you should always read the controls that you're attempting to audit for your, your company. Oh, that's some good advice. Jared, do the complete opposite for me. Give me some bad advice in dealing with a SOC 2. I would say SOC 2 is not all or nothing. You don't need to try and swallow every single control day one. Okay. So that's, I think that sounds like good advice. Or you should should try to control swallow of everything on day one. Right, exactly. So a lot of people look at SOC 2 and the bad advice is they'll try and do all of the controls all at once. And that's okay. So so you're suggesting do all the controls all at once. Correct. That would be the bad advice. That is the okay. bad advice. Yep. <laughs> all right. Kim, give me worse advice than that. I think you should write down everything on paper and you should use your handy fax machine that you have in your home office all the time. Ah. That is awesome. I like it. Well, let's begin this show. Get ready. It's Super Cyber Friday. All right. We go. Welcome, everybody, to Super Cyber Friday. Today's topic is hacking SOC 2 for critical thinking on trust, security, and performance. All right, our guest, who you just met moments ago, that is Jared Mendenhall. He is the CISO for Impossible Foods. Uh, my son is a big fan of the Impossible Foods nuggets. Uh, and Kim Elias, who is the Senior Compliance Specialist over at Vanta. All right, Vanta, guess what? They're the sponsor for today. Brand new sponsor of CISO Series. In fact, we have many episodes of Super Cyber Friday coming up sponsored by Vanta, so we're very excited to have them on board. Uh, guess what? Six different ways you can participate. Number one is chat room. Many of you have discovered that already. Uh, you can, for our bad ideas, submit how not to approach SOC 2. Let me point out, I am wearing one of these awesome CISO series jackets. Now, many of the people who keep who win are ones who've already won one of these jackets. And you win a jacket, you just get a guest certificate to Amazon. But if you have not won one of these, this is a great way to win. Come up with a really funny and entertaining way not to approach SOC 2, and you could conceivably win. I have a, a panel of CISOs who decide the winner. It's not me. It's a panel of CISOs. All right. Submit tips on how to manage SOC 2 compliance so that you would label those as 10%. Now, we haven't had a person come on in a little while. If you're brave enough, want to ask a question, have a comment to make, just type bring me on all in caps in the chat room and Aaron, our producer, will try to get you on. Ask a question. If you look in the upper right hand corner, there is a little uh, speech bubble with a question mark in it. Just click on that and ask whatever question you have. And you can also vote for your favorite question as well. Just a couple more things I want to mention. Today's schedule. Notice the polls are not up. We are having issues with the polls on this new version of Crowdcast. We hope to bring the polls back. Um, but we will have one tiny poll at the end, but we'll play our games, public interest department. Yes. Then we'll have our last questions and advice. And uh, our next scheduled show also sponsored by Vanta will be hacking U S data privacy and our critical thinking on dealing with the ever changing patchwork of regulations. Now that is not next Friday because that is veterans day, but the Friday after that is the 17th. And that's when it's going to be. And guess what? If you, if you mosey your, your eyes and your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a link that says, join us 1117 for hacking U.S. data privacy. If you click that button, it'll open another window, will not take you out of this, and you can register for the one in two weeks without jumping out of this. All right, now let's begin our show. Please go ahead and register. I will remind you a couple of times to do just that. All right, let us just very simply, Kim, would you... For those of us not in the know, we don't know what this term SOC 2 is. Uh, it does not stand for Security Operations Center. I do want to mention that. It does not. <laughs> yes, that's something different. Uh, it is not the, the, the Electric Boogaloo sequel to the Security Operations Center. Um, what is this? And as I understand, whenever you are starting a company, getting this SOC 2 certificate report, analysis, audit is critical. What is it? Why is it so darn critical? Yeah. So it's a cybersecurity framework. Uh, it was developed by uh, the um, uh, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Uh, so they're the ones who audit you on it, but it's about security. It's about it's how you handle- It's the coolest group ever. Oh, I bet. Uh, but it's how you handle and process essentially customer data for your products and your services. 
why is it important? I think there's lots of good reasons why it's important. But one of the big ones, it's becoming much more and more the standard for how you demonstrate security to your customers. That is a good point, that line, demonstrate security. What would you add to that, Jared? And for those who, those who need to understand why this darn thing is so valuable and why we're spending an hour talking about it? Yeah, SOC is obviously very important. And I've been on both sides of the house. So, um, you know, my previous history, I ran managed services offerings where, you know, we had to be SOC both one and two compliant, which we can talk mm -hmm. about. Um, but also as a customer, you know, I, I reach out to our third parties all the time. Every time we're bringing in a new vendor, I want to see their SOC report. Because what that does for me is it demonstrates a level of maturity that they may or may not have, right? Um, and I'd say the last point on it, it does stand for system and organizational controls. Uh, I like to emphasize the organi organizational side of that because a lot of SOC 2 involves not just tooling or cybersecurity systems, but actually involves, in my mind, a large set of uh, policies and documentation and procedures that you also need to uh, have in place in order to be compliant. Excellent point. All right, please get your questions in. Uh, we would like to hear from all of you uh, regarding um, any questions you may have to talk to. I can imagine you don't have any. And I just want to point out that John suggests his bad idea is have the results of your SOC 2 screen printed on large wind socks that you fly in front of your corporate HQ right next to your ISO 9001 certified billboard. It's not that bad an idea. I kind of like it. <laughs> By the way, lots of good bad ideas coming in. Plus, please get in your 10% tips in as well. Okay. Um, so why, I mean, it seems the reason you have to get this SOC 2 compliant or as best as you could do right away is just pretty much it's kind of the cost of doing business. So like if you don't do it, nobody can trust to do business with you. Am I sort of right in that basic theory, uh, Kim? I think to some degree, yeah. there was an interesting change a few years ago in which the AICPA adapted the, the trust service criteria, which make up SOC 2. And they said, vendor management should probably be part of this. We should care about how people are checking other businesses. When they did that, they sort of took the world by storm and they almost incidentally set a standard of which if everyone is supposed to care about vendor management, what's one thing they should be checking a SOC 2? So more and more companies are getting it and it has become the standard. I'd also add that it's a great way if you're concerned about security, which I would be curious if you're not at all in a business, but if you are <laughs> curious about security. I believe everyone online in here is. I think if you're joining this podcast, that's yes. a great point. So, okay, with this crew, we don't have to worry about those those other use case. But I think um, it's a way to understand like what you have and you don't have as like a preliminary audit. I doubt mm. you just only get a SOC 2 and never consider anything else. Talk to lets you know what you're doing and what you're not doing. Very good. And I mean, were you ever at the ground stages, Jared, yourself with an organization that had to do its very first SOC 2? I was actually, and it was a very interesting learning experience because I actually, before that, came from a PCI environment. Mm -hmm. um, PCI is very cut and dry. It's pass or fail. Uh, we'll talk about this. SOC 2 is not, right? You don't have to have every control in place in order to have a, a, or successfully complete a SOC 2 audit. Um, so that's important. I think, um, you know, for us gapping and uh, looking at where we were missing controls, even before we tried to start a SOC 2 is really important, uh, which we can talk about. Um, and, you know, again, back to that organizational side, I, I think making sure that you've given yourself time, right? Not just you, but the organization as a whole to, to kind of grow into it. Uh, get the right different uh, different organizations involved, right? It involves HR, it involves your developers, it involves your infrastructure teams. So everybody kind of has a hand in this. And uh, there's different business owners that will have ownership over some of these controls. So, you know, coming in into this, making sure you do a good gap assessment, uh, make sure you bring those business partners in early, right? Don't catch them by surprise. So that way they have time to think about these controls and, um, you know, have time to plan their their uh, next, you know, several months such that they can complete these controls successfully. By the way, Larry Rosen showing his age here with his bad idea, we reply to all requests for your SOC 2 reports with a meme from Rowan and Martin's laughing. You didn't have a, you didn't have a more dated reference for us, Larry? <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> probably with maybe something with a socket to me. Uh, I would assume would be the appropriate uh, one. Ah, we have someone from Spain joining us as well. All right, so I want to know what are red flags for those for somebody looking at a sock too. I'm not. We're not talking about creating it for someone looking at a sock too, because the whole issue of vendor, you know, vendor management and third party risk is a hot, hot, hot issue. Mm. Um, and we had actually another guest on before that created this report of like what to see and not see in, in third party questionnaires. I'm interested to know what would be something wonderful to see in a SOC 2 and what would be a red flag? And I know there's a lot here, but let's hit hit some of the big ones that are, or not maybe big ones, just the common ones we see, Kim. Yeah. So a big one is if a report has exceptions and what those exceptions are. So an exception is essentially when you don't pass a control or a test. So you would have a note from your auditor saying, this is what we saw. This is why they didn't pass for this test. To Jared's point, that doesn't mean you fail. You can't fail a SOC 2. But depending on the control or the test, not always a great sign. If someone fails for encryption of their customer data, I'd have some pretty significant questions for them. Okay, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. But looking <laughs> at that that section essentially and seeing, hey, if you had a bunch of exceptions, if you had a, a one that seems pretty significant to you feeling secure about your data with trusting it to this vendor. Um, and then also the the business gets a chance to give a response. So there's a management right. response for every exception that you would get. I want to know what's a good response to not encrypting the data? Um, have you seen one? Because I bet you're I, very different. I have yet to see a good response to that one. That would be a really big exception. Jared, as a, as a CISO, I imagine you have pretty strong thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, to your point, it kind of comes back to what do you care about, right? I mean, SOC 2 has a lot of different controls. Um, I'm less concerned about things like, you know, maybe their security awareness is, a, I think, a common exception we see. Yeah, sure, we trained everybody. We missed a few people. Okay. You know, I mean, that happens, right? I'm not too worried about that. Um, if there's something tangential to, you know, the criticality of the service or a piece of that SOC 2 audit that's telling me something, hey, this is a piece of our our program that you really do care about, uh, like data encryption is probably a, a great example. Maybe data backups and disaster okay. recovery, another great example. If I see exceptions in there, then David, to your question, I want to see a, a very strong management response, essentially taking ownership, right? Saying, hey, we know we have this gap. We're going to do something about it. If it's kind of more of a squishy, eh, you know, it's not that big of a deal, then I have concerns, right? That's okay. Applied. So, yeah, I mean, every, also, everyone understands people are in a security journey for that matter yeah. and where they have it on their roadmap. And, oh, this is at the very top. We're dealing with it as we speak, kind of a thing. Understand. All right. Lots of good questions have already come in. Let me get, get to one of these right now. What is typically the biggest hurdle? This comes from Ian Davis, I should mention. What is typically the biggest hurdle for most organizations? So, you know, having the established policies, implementing the controls, uh, something else. What, 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 what do you think? I'll start with you, Jared, on this one. A, a big hurdle for doing SOC, and we're going to actually get into your history of dealing with this for SOC too. So big hurdles to even getting started, maybe even. I think, you know, it doesn't have to be a hurdle. I mean, it can be a good justification, but, you know, there's an investment here. There's a cost of of doing this, you know, both in terms of actual material costs. There's also soft costs, right? I could be doing something else as opposed to doing a compliance standard. And so I would recommend before you even go on this journey, you know, do a business case. Look at it. How much business are you losing out on? Not every customer you're talking to is publicly traded. That doesn't mean that they're not asking for SOC 2 reports. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm not publicly traded today where I work now. I still ask for SOC 2 reports because I want to see that. Um, so do that cost benefit analysis. Look at how much it's going to, to take to get into it uh, before you even try and, and, you know, bring in auditors and start the conversation. Uh, what would you add? Big, what, what, it, what is the biggest hurdle, Kim? I would say, depending on how far along you are in your company, the biggest hurdle could be asking people to change their processes, asking them to do something differently and saying, oh, but SOC 2 tells us that it's really important. Um, I think especially with engineering teams, especially in early companies, they have to move very quickly. They have to kind of do things on the fly. Sometimes asking them to take a step back and change how they do uh, you know, their change management can have the best of intentions, but can be a harder conversation than just, we'll do it this way. Uh, that can be a pretty big hurdle and, and a time commitment for a business. All right, it's time to play our first game. Do you 
you know what others are thinking? On the public interest. I have not even seen these myself. Uh, one of our producers, Rich Strapolino, created these. So I'm actually going to play along myself because I haven't seen these. I'm going to see how well I do. I haven't done, done this myself. All right. You're going to see how this game plays in just a second. And the audience will play along too. They usually do. Most average monthly search queries, what do you think gets more? ISO 27001 or SOC 2? I am actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock my answer in here. I'm actually going to say ISO 27001. That's what I say. What do you think? Kim, Jared? I think SOC 2. I think SOC 2. SOC 2. Jared? I'm going to go with ISO because it's more complicated and it, uh, SOC 2 is US focused where ISO is global. So I'm going to assume ISO 2007-1 is searched right. more often. All right. Now, I, I want to point something out to you, Kim, before I go to the next slide. It is extraordinarily, di extraordinarily difficult to get four out of four on these. Okay? okay. So let's see how we go. And the answer is... Ah, ISO 27001. It wins. All right. You're 0 for 1 right now, Kim. Jared and I are 1 for 1 right now. I'm actually excited to be playing along myself. All right. Oh, geez. Here we go. Security, availability. availability. These are all the, the five pillars of a SOC 2, right? Okay. Security, availability, integrity, privacy, confidentiality. Which ones do you think it is? And by the way, the letter, the reason the letters change is because our audience is just a few seconds behind us and it gets confusing if we keep the letters the same. So what do you think? I think C. Uh, security is you can't get around doing that in your SOC 2. The others are optional. So it's the... No, I should also mention, let me make something clear. When people search for this, doesn't mean they're searching for SOC 2. They're searching for mm -hmm. literally anything on the internet. So don't just be thinking SOC 2 here. I think I'll still stand by C, but I feel less confident in it. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with C as well. I'm going with C. I'm going to stay with C as well. I mean, that's a much broader term. So you have to assume that's going to be the most searched. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm with you. Let's see how we go. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, oh my God. Integrity blows it out of the water. Did anyone pick integrity? I think we all got <laughs> nailed by that one. Holy moly. That I, I honestly got, I would have probably picked that as my last. No, not jeez. Not, It'd you know, be interesting they, Dave, if you could pull up the remaining search string, like integrity of what like, <laughs> people are interested in here, right? I want uh, actually someone in the chat room do that. See what the because I wouldn't be surprised if integrity is like a brand name that we don't know about that people are searching integrity as a brand name because that often is the case here. All right, so now unfortunately, Kim, you're over two. Yeah. Aaron and I just have one of two. Let's here we go. Question number three. There's only four here. Risk management or change management? Which one uh, are you going for? I know what I'm going for, but I'm not going to answer yet. Kim? I think I'll go with H, risk management. And you, Jared? Same. Yeah, I'm going with that too. Risk management. All three. And the correct answer is risk management. Very good. But not too bad. Change management. Still reasonably close. Everyone, it looks like everyone picked H, except Mike Phillips. All right. All right. Last one. Instant response. So, by the way, you're on the board now, Kim. Good job. Uh, instant response versus incident management. I'll, I'll respond and say my answer. I'm going to say it's going to be uh, instant response. I think the same. I think they're very related, but I think most people with all the companies in the news lately with their handling or not handling of uh, incidents, they were curious about response. I think, Jay. I don't know. I feel like playing devil's advocate this time. So I'm going to say incident management. All right. And the correct answer is, ooh, you <laughs> won. That was a surprise. Just barely edging us out here. All right. So what'd you get? You get two or three. You got th three, Jared? You got three out of four. Wow. Good job. Good job. That one, that integrity one was difficult. I could not have gotten that one. Very impressed. All right. Here's what I want to ask. So we're talking about SOC 2. I'm going to start with you, Jared, on this. Uh, by the way, no one got – there's no conceivable way, by the way, in the chat room, anybody got four out of four. There's no way because nobody – did anyone get integrity? Just answer that. Did anyone in the chat room actually get it? Because I can't can't imagine anyone got that one. Anyways, please do uh, – uh, please someone do look onto Google and tell us – why the heck integrity is so popular? I'd be interested to know if there's a brand name integrity or there could be a rapper or a DJ name integrity. That's probably why that's the weird stuff like that happens all the time. 
so, oh, Bryn got integrity. I'm impressed, Bryn. Good job, Bryn. All right. So, Jared, I, I was teasing the fact that you've kind of gone through this issue before. And did you have any tooling or anything to sort of assist you? Or was it you in a spreadsheet uh, to try to full, figure this whole darn thing out? I hate to admit it, but it was me in the spreadsheet. Um, oh, ouch. <laughs> I don't recommend that approach. Um, we did, um, I, you know, well, so you don't you don't recommend you and a spreadsheet is what you're saying. <laughs> I'm actually really good at spreadsheets probably because <laughs> I've done security for a while. Um, but I would not recommend that approach. It's obviously a lot more onerous. It takes a lot more work. It's a lot more error prone potentially. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we did I, later on invest in some tooling, which helped to kind of automate it. But, uh, you know, compared to what I was doing in 2018 to now and, all of the different tools that have come into the marketplace. There's, there's much easier ways of doing it than using a spreadsheet. All right. Well, this is a very nice setup for mm -hmm. Kim now because this was the very exact problem that Vanta heard that you chose to come up with a solution. So I'm going to set you up here. Kim, what is, what is it that Vanta does to make this experience less miserable? Yeah, I think our CEO truly had a vision and she thought, hey, it does not need to be this complicated, this onerous, this tedious going through Excel spreadsheets. I feel your pain, Jared. I've also done that before many times. Um, we automated uh, compliance. So we said, hey, you want to do a SOC 2? We'll help you. We'll provide you with the controls and the tests that you need to do. We'll take it one step further. We'll create API connections with the tools that you use. So you don't even have to say whether you're doing something or not. Our tool will know it. We'll give you the policies that you need to have and we'll help you edit them and, you know, include what information you need. We'll help you manage some of the components of SOC 2. So if you need vendor management, we'll help with that. We have access reviews. There's lots of features that essentially say, hey, this is what I'm doing for SOC 2. And we give mm -hmm. auditors access to it. So instead of going back and forth for weeks or months with your auditor and saying, I swear this is what we do. Here are the 10 screenshots to show you we did it across the year. You can give them mm -hmm. access to our tool and show them hey, this is what I've been doing and the streams lies to the process on both sides. So it also, I'm assuming since you're making live connections, you can get sort of up to the minute knowledge rather than these annual type reports. That's a great point. Continuous monitoring is one of like our, our, our pride things. We can help those who are in compliance or security or, or even a founder of a company know immediately if there's a control that isn't passing. So you don't have to wait or do an internal audit on your own, but or wait for an auditor to tell you. You can flag it. You can talk to the team. You can resolve it in real time. So how does this, because one of the things that I've learned uh, from interviewing is that the experience with the auditor is kind of a two-way street. What is the kind of feedback that the auditors are giving when they're seeing the reports from Vanta? Yeah, so they're getting they're they're creating the reports to be clear to themselves. They take that okay. information that's in Vanta and they put it into a report. They show that they tested those controls. It gives them an opportunity to still ask more questions, but to see like the data behind the tests that they're doing as well. So instead of saying, "Okay, this is a screenshot or a live share of, you know, one of your systems," they're actually getting that access indirectly through the tool and showing what the the system is showing you. So they get more validation than what, excuse my ignorance, what was the alternative? The alternative was a lot of time spent validating screenshots of your of your systems. Essentially wow. having an engineer go in and take a screenshot of AWS and showing these are the settings we have instead of having the settings read right into Vanta. Yeah, kind of dovetailing on that. And something that I think that's really important when you're doing an audit is establishing confidence, right? I mean, they're kind of, they're sure, they're looking at your controls, but they're also kind of looking at you. Do you care about this? Are you organized? Um, are you wasting their time, right? Are they getting there and having to ask a bunch of questions and find stuff? Um, one of the things I did in a spreadsheet, again, was, you know, we had the list, right? So they'd walk in, we would go down and hey, we've got all of the evidence you're looking for. Obviously, systems like Vanta can help automate that, which is fantastic. But having, you know, putting some extra diligence in up front, making sure you're organized, make sure uh, it ensures you're not wasting the auditor's time. They can get out of there much more quickly, which, by the way, they they really appreciate. Uh, so there's there's definite value in that. In that, Make everyone happy for that matter. All right. Here's a question that got voted up from Derek McGee, who asked that, um, and this is actually not the, the checklist you're doing, but it's sort of a pre-checklist, if you will. Is there any online checklist or roadmap out there that you would recommend to tackle several things before spending the money for an audit? Or maybe you can just verbally suggest some, like, you know, 
you have this, this, and this? Well, may, I think you need an audit kind of a thing. Like, what's the environment that getting a SOC to? Because you were talking about working with public companies is, and you were saying, well, that's not necessarily critical, but my feeling that would be one of the items on the on the checklist. Do you have answers to this or know of a checklist? What do you got, Kim? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but I would say Vanta helps with that. You don't have to use a tool like Vanta and immediately engage with an auditor. In fact, you can spend time using and playing with the tool to understand your own capabilities before you get to that stage. Um, I'd also say, I, you know, we said at the beginning, reading the controls. I don't know that there's ever going to be like a neat checklist of 10 things you can check to fully know your audit. I think truly mm. looking at what you're going to be testing and understanding what that applies to your business is probably the best way before you spend money. But it, it all boils down to all the handling customer data and just ask yourself, how am I handling customers' yeah. data? And if I've got a lot of it and a lot of it is private, then maybe I need to start looking at controls. Yes. And what type of data you have, yes. too. That's a really important factor as well. Yes. Uh, what would you add to this, um, Jared? I think it's really, really important. So you've done your business case. You understand, yes, we need this. Bring the audit team in to do a gap assessment, right? Because they're going to treat it like an audit. And they're going to look at all the controls. They're going to pull in all the business teams. They're going to say, okay, if we were auditing you today, here's what we would find. Um, and if you're serious about this, I think that's that provides a lot of value because now you know exactly what you need to accomplish and you've got something you can build a roadmap against, right, based on those results. All right. Uh, another question that's just got voted up very heavily here, and this comes from uh, Stuart Sandstrom. Any commentary on the value <laughs> of SOC readiness engagements? I haven't heard this term, but SOC readiness engagement, is this something that is sold by vendors? How does this work? Kim? Yeah, Jerry just actually explained it very well. So a SOC 2 readiness assessment or engagement is essentially uh, giving an auditor money to do a uh, not formal, but informal version of an audit. Um, mm -hmm. So it helps you understand what you have, what you don't have. Commentary on the value. I think if you are in a place where you're really not sure what you have in place and you want someone to assess it, that's a great tool. Um, I think having no idea or being very confident are not necessarily the best use cases for a readiness assessment, but it's always valuable to get more data. So I can't say that you should. Well, it. so the idea is if you don't know what you're dealing with and you feel a little clueless, like any kind of consultancy need, it's a necessary move. Or if you make a significant change in your business or you're changing auditors, like there are use cases where that's definitely extra helpful. All right. Yeah, I mean, cool. one of the biggest mistakes you can do approaching this is, again, misscoping it, right? So if you don't understand what controls you actually need um, and you're over scoping your assessment, you've just created a lot of extra work for your team, right? And you've probably spun your wheels on, on, on some things. And there's things like, uh, you know, if you look at privacy is one great example, which they've added fairly recently. A lot of people will say, well, I have PII data in my system. Does that mean I need to follow the the uh, privacy standards in SOC. Not necessarily, right? Some of that's actually covered in the confidentiality areas. And that's where an auditor can be super valuable because they can show you where, you know, you actually need to have controls and where you don't. By the way, James uh, Sparenberg actually asked another question. I don't know if it, just in the, in the chat. I don't know if this exists. But he says, when building a startup, when, what tool slash checklist, and I don't know if tool and checklist is the same thing, but would be recommended to be compliant from day one? Does such a thing exist? I can't imagine. It's, you got to connect it to your environment. Nothing. As soon as you connect it to your environment, nothing's compliant, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would say there probably isn't one tool that's a perfect solution, but there are tools that can help a lot with some of the capabilities you need to do. We talked about change management. That's a great example. Uh, not mm -hmm. manually tracking your change management and having a tool in place is going to help a ton with a, a bunch of related tests for controls. Um, but I, I would I'd be very surprised if there was one stop shop for, for all of those. It would be nice. And be careful of the snake oil. There are people on online promising, over promising, under delivering, right? On this, um, mm -hmm. if you Google, hey, I want to get my sock two, there's people that say, oh, we can have your sock two done in a week. There's, there's no the way same, to actually. Those are the same people who can get you zero trust in, in a week as well. <laughs> exactly. So that, there's no easy button for this, right? It, it does require diligence. All right. Let's talk about the, the, you talked a little bit about this before, Jared, about the, the pain. Give me, give me one or two. I made this mistake. You don't make it too. Give it to me. And we're going to come back to you, Kim, on this one. 
what what are two pain one or two painful mistakes you made that you you are advising your fellow security professionals to avoid? Yeah, I think when I took on SOC two, one of my you know my feeling on it was like, hey, I can I can take this, I can own it, I can drive this and get it done, right? But the reality is, there's things that again you don't necessarily have control over, and you know I think one of the mistakes I made early in was not giving the business teams enough time to really digest what we were trying to accomplish. I think everybody was on board. We saw the the need. We saw the value in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be considerate of everybody's time and what their other things are on their plates that need to accomplish. So, you know, first and foremost, making sure that you are in alignment with the rest of the teams. Um, you have a solid roadmap in place and you're not pushing uh, so hard that, you know, you're not accomplishing all of the objectives that you're looking for. So make sure you give everybody time to be successful at this. By the way, Joshua Mason asked this question, which, by the way, it's a valid question here. If compliance doesn't equal security, which we've heard this in uh, for many, many, many years, um, then what is the purpose, the value or purpose of compliance? A very good question. And by the way, just so you know, Joshua, it's coming up soon. We just recorded a whole episode answering that very, very question. And I will give you the skeleton answer of that. And that is, it is a minimum guidance for those in your industry. It does not mean it is security, but it is a place for everyone to begin. Would you agree, Kim? A hundred percent. I think there's an important distinction there, but compliance, keep in mind the word comply, you're complying with something. So some sort of standard, some sort of regulation. So it's the cost of doing business in your industry, yeah. Yeah. essentially is what it is. All right. Going back your pre your Vanta days, what were some <laughs> painful mistakes that you made, Kim? Um, viewing auditors as the bad guys in your compliance journey, I think is a mistake. Well, it's, it's their fault showing up with the black hat. Don't blame them. I mean, don't Honestly, blame yourself. And it's their fault for asking tough questions that you don't always yeah. want to answer. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's truly a collaboration and yes, mm -hmm. they're the ones handing you an audit report that you're going to show to customers. And yes, they're the ones telling you, no, no, you shouldn't be doing this. But at the end of the day, they're helping you understand areas of your business that you can't look at with the same eyes that they can. First of all, they're certified, they're CPAs. Give me an example of just that, because that's a really good point. That very last line you said, give me an example of something that you can't really see or you don't understand or you don't have the perspective of that an auditor does. I think policy is a great example. You have an incident response policy and you go, this is clear. I know if there's an incident, who to talk to, what we're going to do, what our procedures are. An auditor might read that and be like, if I was new to your company, I wouldn't know what to do. I don't think that you're fully understanding the scope if you're focusing so narrowly on these specific steps. What if something really bad happens? You might not be fully prepared for that. Auditors have seen a lot of different things. They'll give you their perspective. So I think that back and forth is, is key. They're not going to tell you you do this in your business because their job is to assess you, but they can identify the things that will improve your security going forward, as well as give you the report that you would hope to show to customers. By the way, Matt Stamper makes the comment, SOC 2 is an audit. SOC 2 compliance does not exist. Mm -hmm. Very good clarification. Jared? Yeah, I think I, I want to go back to a point you were making about cost of doing business. And, you know, something, David, that you've addressed many, many times is how do you show value in a program, right? And a lot of times we talk about risk reduction. SOC 2 is actually one of the uh, places where you can actually directly attach certain security controls directly to revenue. And that is extremely powerful, right? When you start talking about justifying your broader security program, you know, I, I love SOC 2 in, in that it's a great lever for you to actually show value to the business. Like if we do this, here's, you know, direct revenue coming into the company as a result or not, right? If we're not doing this well. Uh, so I just want to make sure I emphasize that this isn't just a cost of doing business in this case. This actually helps you show value and um, drives, drives revenue for the company, which to me is exciting. All right, let's get, uh, we're going to be playing our next game of uh, Department of Yes very soon. Just getting our, our favorite bad ideas in. Again, my apologies that we don't have a poll up for it. Blame Crowdcast. We still love Crowdcast, but this damn poll thing does not work. Well, oh, they just came in. All right. So um, let's, uh, let's get the call just came in. Hello. Welcome to the Department of Yes, where no request is ever rejected. Okay. Um to i'm gonna there's a lot of good ones here um <laughs> God. some of these are just plain old stupid um all right and this 
All right. I'm going to throw this one to you, Jared, first. Uh, this comes from Ian Davis. Let generative AI complete your SOC 2 audit without any oversight. Just literally feed that sucker in chat GPT <laughs> and let her rip. <laughs> Okay, so one of our... By the way, he, he, Jared actually submitted a bunch of bad bad, uh, bad ideas or actually what's worse scenarios via asking ChatGPT. So he's familiar with relying on ChatGPT to do his work for him. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but yes, it can be helpful. <laughs> oh, that's what I said. That's what I said. Um, okay, so you know, one of the key concepts in security and one of our jobs is to say yes and, right? Okay. We don't want to be the department of no. We've talked about that before. So I'm going to say yes and if you want to use generative AI to feed in a bunch of frankly sensitive data about your security program, let's build a generative, generative AI system that is privatized, that is contained and is not taking that data that you're sharing with it to train the broader AI, which then would be available for public consumption. So that is how I would approach that problem. All right, you Hooray! approached one angle of it, but you didn't approach the no oversight part. That's why, so you're getting a yay and a boo on this one. <laughs> All right, so uh, Kim, I'm gonna ask you, why do you wanna do this let generative AI complete your SOC 2 audit without any over oversight? Yeah, I think um, we shouldn't be, you know, looking all of the new capabilities um, like a gift horse in the mouth. I think you have to, con you know, conclude that these are inevitable in your security and your compliance program. Use what you can for AI and be able to understand that it's going to generate something that it's seen lots and times before and more and more people are going to be putting SOC 2 related information and in LLMs and it'll, you know, conclude with some interesting insight that you might have not gotten with a small team on its own. Okay, I'm going to get and I'm, yes! I'm giving you a double yes on that. But again, similarly, Aww. I'm giving you that response for the no oversight. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. That was that was very good. Okay. That good job, Ian Davis. That was a good ba bad idea right there. Um, let's. Um, oh, this from Justin M. I'll start with you, Kim. Post your SOC two findings on Instagram to get feedback on how to fix those findings. Why do you want to do this? Yeah, well, your findings are going to be public anyway, because that's going to be part of your SOC 2 report once an auditor issues them. So if you're going to get that from you know the public, you don't always get that immediate response from your customers of what they're concerned about. Instagram is a place where people do not hold back with their opinions or their feedback. So if you put it there, you'll get the hard truth of what people think about it and be able to learn for next time. All right. Bravo! A, you, there's a, that's good. That's a tip of a really good answer. I'm looking for an even better one, Jared. Could you have it for me? I don't. I mean, that's about as best as you can do at that point. It was great. It got posted. Let's take some learnings from this. That's all you're going to be able to get out of that. Well, the obvious answer. Oh, no. Oh. Oh. The obvious answer here is group think, group advice is always great. When we get group advice, it's phenomenal. And then secondly, the speed of response, which you did, did tip on, Kim, is what's phenomenal. It's getting fast, immediate yeah. feedback. We love that. We love getting fast, immediate feedback. That's why you want to be a stand-up comedian, because you know if you get a laugh or you don't get a laugh, whether the joke worked or not. So put all of your SOC 2 report in a joke. And if they yeah. laugh, it's good. If not, well, there you go. Uh, we got you. I'd be concerned sure. about feeding adversaries information, right? Because there is some specific data in that, right? Yeah, well, that's uh, why it's a bad idea, Jared. You figured <laughs> it out. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Good job, Jared. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, it's, it's, it's called best bad idea. It wasn't called great idea written poorly. It is called best bad idea. And a great job, everybody. Good. We will, by the way, announce the winner who, if it's someone new, could win one of these awesome news. Hang tight for that. Um, all right, we and I'm going to get to some of our 10% uh, better tips in um, in just a second. Actually, uh, let me mention this one. Joshua Mason, turn your policies into automated Jira or whatever CRM tickets. Ah, by the way, does Vanta do that, or does do you know of a tool like the way to feed this into Jira tickets? Like, let's deal with this now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vanta, Vanta does have an offering where you can integrate it with whatever you use for your project management to uh, create tickets based on the tasks you would have with your your tests and your controls. Yeah, awesome. So well, you can take Joshua Mason's ten percent tip and feed it in there as yeah. well. Um, so, 
Tell me, Jared, how are you getting better at dealing with SOC 2 today since you've gone through all of the mistakes previously? Yeah, I think, well, now I'm on the customer side, right? So I get to ask all of the hard questions. Um, you know, first, we obviously have a broader third party risk management program around this. So mm -hmm. don't treat SOC 2 as an end all be all. Um, I think what excites me, and not just for SOC 2, for us, we do this with other compliance standards, how do we automate these controls, right? How do we pull in the data? How do we get that real-time feedback if there's a violation? Uh, one of the projects that we've been working through is, uh, to your point, Kim, about you know getting that data into a ticketing system. We yeah. actually feed that type of data now directly into our SOC, because I want to know, you know, not just for SOC 2, but any, any uh, setting or configuration that impacts security, I want to know about that in real time. If something's getting changed that could cause an issue, we want to get that in front of somebody as, as soon as possible so that they can take a look at it and do something about it. Very, very good. Um, let me mention some more of our 10% tip. Uh, well, Michael Swinarski says uniform, uniform controls framework. That's what we're always looking for. If, um, hold on, I don't know who did this one. Um, speak up if it's yours. If you're a startup offering a new service, obtain your SOC 2 as you launch the service. Uh, I don't know if you can do it as you launch, but it's easier to obtain the cert from the start rather than bolt it on later. Is that true, Kim? I think? think there's pros and cons. Um, I think when you're early, uh, to, to a point discussed earlier, I think it's easier to change your processes. If you're 30 or 40 years doing the same thing in business, good luck, I think, to tell your teams to do something differently. Um, looks like Jeff did this question. Yes, Jeff um, Coslo did that. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think definitely it takes time. It takes money. I wouldn't say it's something you should do lightly. I don't think it's something you should do immediately right off the cuff before you have a product or you have a team. Um, but I, I do think there are positives for doing it earlier in the process for sure. By the way, Joshua Mason asked this question. None of us are lawyers, by the way. Unless there are, is it, if there's a lawyer in the chat room, please speak up on uh, Joshua Mason's question. Is If there is a data breach, can the SOC 2 auditors be held accountable? I got to imagine that there's a lot of like legal mumbo jumbo that says, I'm not accountable if, if it's w what I say here. There's got to be. Yes. Yes. Kim? And you also have to sign some pretty serious paperwork that you put, you know, information to your auditor as honest as you could be and that your business did not false represent itself. So I would say they assessed at the time to determine if an incident was possible. Just, if something way, happens a week Dwayne later. Has, Dwayne Grant has a good analogy of saying your bookkeeper won't accept liability if you lose money. Yeah, and same thing with your accountant, for that matter. Uh, uh, although, 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 excuse me, your accountant, though, they file your taxes improperly. That's it. Mm -hmm. But that's given the information that they were given, too, for that matter. Uh, real quick, David, can I give Jeff an extra high five? Because yes. secured by design is so much easier <laughs> than trying to go back and fix security problems after the fact. I've seen mm -hmm. I've seen this everywhere. You know, you, somebody will go in, they'll they'll build a solution improperly. It costs so much more time and money and energy after the fact to fix something than it does to build it right the first time. I cannot emphasize that enough. I have seen it so many times. It's cost security teams all over the world so much extra time to do this. So I love it. Anytime I hear that, hey, hey, let's how do we do this right the first time? That's definitely, in my mind, the right way to approach these problems. By the way, uh, uh, Kim's colleague will be joining us in, Matt, correct? Who's going to be joining us in a couple of weeks on November 17th, 2023 to talk about hacking U.S. data privacy. This is going to be an interesting conversation because U.S. data privacy is very different than European, but often we are guided by data privacy in other countries, especially given that most of us often end up doing business all over the world. Once you open up a website, boom, now you're connected to everybody. Um, so please stick around, uh, not stick around, please register for that event. If you click that darn thing, remember I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I forgot to mention it until now, click on it, register for two weeks, and then you don't have to worry about it. And then you come back and you have fun with us yet again. Also, I'm going to talk to everybody out there that has not come to our meetup portion. I see a huge number of people online and guess what? I would love it if all of you would join us for the meetup afterwards. This is a ton of fun. You get to meet face-to-face. -face. Let me ask everybody, don't all glom into one group, but break up into small groups. It, it sort of simulates a virtual party where you're like three or four people can have a conversation here, three or four here, da da da, da And you all sort of join into a wonderful conversation here. So don't, uh, please join. Just please join us. We'd love to meet you. It's, especially if you've never, ever come, I'm eager to meet you. Please just connect with me. Love to say hello. 
All right. With that being said, um, anyways, very, very active chat room with, by the way, slamming the advice, awesome advice all across the board. I had David Cross got to join, join. Awesome. Uh, he said he wasn't going to be able to, and he able to join us. I appreciate that. Um, uh, oh, by the way, one really good, bad idea from Dwayne Grant, put the marketing group in charge of defining the system scope for the SOC too. Does, would you suggest doing that, either of you? I think they have relevant things to add when it comes to talking about your soft oh, report. Oh, you are so politically smart. <laughs> <laughs> good job there, Kim. Very good job. All right. Let's go. go. Oh, excuse me. Let me go. I have a bunch of questions from our audience I have not addressed yet. All right. Let's go to Joshua Mason's here. Uh why should someone get a SOC 2 and have accountants look at their security program instead of doing a NIST, NIST CSF assessment or ISO 27001 and have security people audit their security program? That's a good question. What the heck is the difference here? Because we all of these come up all the time. Kim, jump in. Yeah, there are different security frameworks. Uh, you should always consider that there are going to be ones that are better for your business, better for your scope, better for what you're looking for. Um, why should SOC 2? Um, I think there are advantages to it. Um, I don't think you should look down on the fact that it's accountants. Um, they're specifically trained to talk about security. It's not just someone who's been doing taxes their whole life and then transitions to this. Um, but the other thing I'll add there too um, is that um, your scope is customized based on your business. SOC 2 does not fit every business. You customize the controls specific to you. So they're not actually just testing SOC 2. They're testing the scope and your business, how you've determined it for SOC 2. It's very specific that way. I will also add one of the things that we hear also from very large enterprises eager to work with startups is they want to see this. They want to see uh, other stuff. Sometimes... If they don't have this, the, the the conversation of doing business with them literally can't even begin. Like, this is the, could we have a phone call? This is the requirement before we can have a phone call kind of a thing. Um, and, and I'll add this too, ISO for ISO 27001, you typically just give your customers a certificate to prove that you passed it. SOC 2, you're giving a report. So that has your control list, that has information about your business, that has information about your management. There's a lot of like good details in there that is really handy to hand over when you're doing business with people that are curious. Jared, uh, you want to add anything to this answer of Josh, Josh's question? Yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, the best compliance standard is one you don't have to follow, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I hate to say it that way, but you know you need to look at this in terms of what's relevant to you, right? Is NIST cybersecurity framework more relevant, right? Um, ISOs for international, typically, if you're trying to sell into businesses overseas. SOC 2 is if you're trying to sell, you know, into the U.S. market and you've got publicly traded customers that you're going after. So I, I think the important part is to really right size any compliance that you're you're looking at and uh, make sure you're picking the right standards for what you need at the time that you need it. Uh, I want to go to jump to this question from John Eric, who we've had on the show before, actually talking about third-party risk management. And this is a damn good question. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming the answer is no, but explain where it lies on this. I'll start with you, Jared. Considering the dynamic risk landscape, is collecting a SOC 2 alone sufficient for vendor supply chain risk management? Obviously not. But to what level it, is it valuable? Like, it's it's got a degree here, doesn't it? Yeah, sure. Of course it does. I mean, you look at third party risk, you're looking at different different factors, right? You're looking at uh, SOC 2, if, if that's relevant to you, you might be, again, looking at a SOC 1 as well, if they could impact your financial control. So it has value from that perspective. I think it shows a level of maturity. Um, but for me, I, I also want more real time data, right? And that's where solution, third party risk management solutions like BitSight or Security Scorecard come into play, because now I can actually see your company's profile and uh, even alert on that, right? So if I see things that are concerning that are actually going on with your your company and your business, now I can reach out to you and, and um, see what's going on. I think that's important. Uh, the other thing I would say here that's also equally important is building a relationship. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, with your vendor and partner network, network we're all trying to sell, solve the same problems, right? So there's a CISO on the other side or another security team on the other side. 
get to know them, talk to them, right? Uh, have a, if it's an important vendor of yours, have a quarterly meeting with them, talk about your challenges and understand kind of their perspective and where they're coming from. So, you know, all of that to say, I think take as much as you can, right? It's more than SOC 2, it's more than just questionnaires. Um, it's really building that relationship and understanding as much as you can holistically about your third parties. Uh, Stuart actually asked an interesting question because we talked about exceptions at the very beginning of the show. And let's quickly answer this and then I'm going to go into closing and then we'll have our closing comments here. Let's say my vendor SOC 2 has some, here, let me put this up. Uh, let me say that my vendor SOC 2 has some exceptions I'd like to understand better. With whom do I connect to, to start a conversation and how do I make that contact if I'm not interested in talking with their salespeople? I'm assuming salespeople wouldn't raise their hand to talk about the SOC too, would they at all, Kim? No. I'd be very surprised. I think yeah, salespeople yeah. can be really well-trained to talk about compliance for the record. But I think mm -hmm. if you're talking about exceptions in a SOC too, you want to talk about the security or compliance team that helps provide that audit information. Um, I, I would give two, I think, answers. First of all, going through like a public, you know, support channel or something like that and saying, hey, I'd like to talk to your security team. Um, but also consider how you got the SOC to. Um, there are people who have sales folks who hand them over, but a lot of times you can go on someone's website and ask for their SOC too. Sometimes they have like Q and A's that you can go back and forth. And sometimes they have like a privacy or a legal or security alias for more information. So to Jared's point, not the worst thing in the world to get somebody on the phone and ask for a meeting, but the very least I'd try and find a security team of some sort. Jared, I'm assuming you've dealt with this before. Saw a few exceptions said, I need to talk to someone about this. Yes. I can tell you the wrong time to have that conversation and that's after a breach and there's attorneys and things involved in between you, right? And you're trying to understand. It's like, well, what are we contractually obligated to say and et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to be in that situation. So it's good to, again, build that relationship. Um, you know, I, yeah, if you see exceptions on the report that are concerning, get on the phone and talk with them. Hopefully they've addressed them through the management statements. Um, but worst case, hopefully you can get some confidence and maybe even build something into your contractual language saying by such and such a date, we will have these exceptions addressed that we've done that in the past. If we see something, you know, that we're particularly concerned with. So at least then you've got some contractual commitments and some legal recourse if those things are not being addressed uh, as you would expect them to be. All right. I'm going to mention a, a few things in closing here, and then we're going to come back with your last comments and advice. And if we can uh, answer a few more questions. Hey, huge thanks to Kim's company, Vanta. Uh, Vanta, oh, do we have a poll up to, uh, if you'd like a warm handoff to the fine people of Vanta? Let's throw that poll up if if we've got that there. Uh, let me know if that if you got that up, Aaron. So we, we will make a nice warm handoff connected with the fine people at Vanta. But, you, you know, you can always go to their website, Vanta.com. And uh, also, I'm sure Kim will provide some other information in just a second about that as well. But please, let's get that poll up. All right. Starting in 98 minutes from now, we'll be doing our Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review show. We've got one of our favorites, Sean Bowen, who's the CISO of the World Connect Corporation, who will be our guest. That's over on the CISO Series YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com slash CISO Series or just go to CISO Series.com, click the YouTube link or go to our events page and click on that. Any of these ways will get you to the show. We just talk about the eight biggest stories in cybersecurity news for that week and we have an expert, Sean, talking about just that. Um, stick around for a meetup. Oh, now you can, by the way, click the link at the bottom. Um, well, actually, it has the old one. Go ahead, Aaron. Change the link at the bottom if you can. Um, what When that changes, uh, there it goes, like magic. It changed. You can click that link now, register to get into Toucan, which is our after show meetup portion where we all get to have conversation face to face. Your little bubbles, you float around, you click bubbles, you join, jump in and out of conversations. Don't be insulted. Don't feel you have to get stuck to one conversation. Just move in and out of conversations. Uh, lastly, you want to sponsor Super Cyber Friday? Just email me. We have one left in 2023 and we want you to have it that would be the very last one december 15th if you're interested in sponsoring just email me at david at ciso series.com i think that's it yes it is all right we have how much time left we got uh, five minutes left so i'm going to start with you kim uh any last thoughts any advice and how would you connect uh, suggest people connect with you and you'll be available in our meetup portion right afterwards correct I will be, yes. Um, to connect with me, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn um, and you can email me at Vanta, just my name, Kim Elias, at Vanta.com. Um, 
any last advice? I think anyone who joined the session and in general who's joining, David, your your podcast, I think you have some sort of curiosity about SOC 2. Depending on how far you are in the process, if you're early, if you've already done it, if you're looking to mature your process, I think the thought process can be one of the most important things you can do. Thinking critically, mm-hmm. analyzing, understanding truly your program beyond just a checkbox of getting an audit is a really a really appropriate way to look at your business. SOC 2 is not just you get it, you're done, you wipe your hands, you're good. It's a continuing evolving process. You don't stop getting a SOC 2 just when you get one. So think about it critically for, during, and after you're doing the process. That's my best advice. All right. And to get in connect with you and Vanta, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, Vanta, feel free to go on on the website and and for me specifically, uh, LinkedIn or kim.elias at vanta.com. All right. And you'll also be available uh, at, at our meetup portion as well. Jared, any know. last pieces of advice and are you hiring over at impossible foods? Um, not currently, unfortunately, I wish we were, but, um, you know, state of the financial market is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd say my advice is this, um, we are all in the same boat. We're all trying to solve the same problems, right? Uh, you can see in this chat window alone, there's a lot of people that have good experience and background in this. So, Do as much networking as you can, right? You don't just need to rely on the vendors, although you should be talking to them, but talk to your your fellows, so to speak, uh, both your uh, people in your immediate network in terms of your third-party risk and uh, partners that you're working with today, but also come to... David at Sparks events are actually fantastic. You know, we were just you, at you the, were at the last live show that we did, which will drop on November twenty first. I was, and you can't underestimate the power of just talking to people in person and getting people's perspectives and challenges and issues that they're having because everybody kind of has their own perspectives, but we're also trying to solve the same problem. So, uh, those events are just a great way to kind of unwind a little bit, but also understand how other people are approaching these problems. So please, please leverage your network. Uh, excellent. All right. Well, I want to thank both uh, you, Kim, and Jared for joining us. And great job, chat room today. Huge kudos. I mean, they, you really blew up with solid advice and lots of great bad ideas. They usually give you a lot of crap for not having a lot of good advice, but mostly just having bad ideas, which, by the way, I appreciate both. But you you delivered on both ends of the spectrum. So let's see if you can deliver and join us in the, in the meetup. Go ahead. Click on the link down below. If you didn't get a chance to register for two weeks, just go to CISOseries.com, click events. You'll see it listed. Please go ahead and register for that. Huge thanks to Kim Elias with Vanta, Jared Mendenhall with Impossible Foods. Thanks to both Aaron and Rich in the background running this whole darn show. Aaron, you can take us out now.